Welcome. Uh, I'm Danny Martins. This is Hamid Mahawar. And today we'll be talking to you about Azure Cloud Shell and using PowerShell from your browser to manage your cloud resources. So just to kind of get a, a feel for the audience, how many of you have used Cloud Shell before? OK, good. So three of you. So that's four. We're going like 25%. We can work with that. Oh, look at that. Some more. All right. Well, first let's go back maybe a year before Cloud Shell, and this might be what you're doing now. Um, so previously, you had to install a bunch of command line tools and uh, install a bunch of your cloud tools, search for what you want to do to manipulate your cloud resources. You might have some dependencies maybe on a Python script, something like that. These, it might not be very efficient. And then you'd have to download these and then try to run them. But wait, then you get prompted to authenticate your session. And so this is a pretty frustrating experience, and you'd have to do this probably about every two weeks. And it could cause a real headache. Introducing, stepping in Cloud Shell. So your Microsoft managed uh, admin environment that gives you authenticated access from virtually anywhere. It allows you to choose your uh, preferred shell, either PowerShell or Bash. It brings your files into a private and secure Azure environment. And it's delivered with uh, some common tools and programming languages. And so the overall goal of Cloud Shell is to save you time. So how does this really work? There's thousands of containers uh, configured and waiting in Azure that are geodiverse, so they're all over the world. And the goal is to connect you with a container that's close to your location, so you have a really fast experience. Uh, you, once you request the shell, you connect and mount your storage, and you get all your files, all of your scripts that you can run anywhere. And all this is ac accessible from anywhere because it's built in Azure, so you can get Cloud Shell on the go from your browser on a mobile device. And so let's jump into some demos. This is what you're really here for. See what Cloud Shell is. So you can see here I'm in the Azure portal. And we have this icon right here, Cloud Shell. So you open this up. And while this is starting, I can make this a little bit bigger so you can see. Just maximize it out. And I'll increase my font size. Can you read that in the back? Cool. All right, so what you can see right away is that our prompt is Azure. So what we've done is we've taken all your Azure resources and mounted them, mounted them as a file system. And so if I do a dir here, this will load up all the subscriptions that I have access to. I have a, a few, so I'll, I'll come up in a second. Maybe that internet's a little slower over here. There we go. And so you can see I have about uh, five or six uh, subscriptions I have access to. So let's navigate into the automation team. And here, we pull out all the resources within this uh, resource group. And so we have a breakdown for all resources, but we've also pulled out the more common resources, like your resource groups, your virtual machines, your web apps, and your storage accounts. And this is an extensible model, so if you see yourself using other resources that aren't in this list, give us some feedback, and then we can add to this list. And so what's really cool is we can go further and we can look at all the virtual machines. There we go. And so this will give, uh, give me all the virtual machines that are inside the subscription. And there's quite a few since this is a sh shared subscription with the rest of the team. And you can see the, the warning that the new uh, Azure command elements are coming. So we can see we've got all these uh, virtual machines inside the subscription, but these aren't really relevant to what I'm Yes, question. Yeah, so your definition of subscription is my company. Uh, right. Yes, it would be, you have, you have your subscription, and then, so for the automation team subscription, that's the overall team subscription, and then we build out our own resource groups. I think Hamid might have something to add. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. Do you have anything to add? OK, we'll keep going. All right, so these, are, are you answer your question? Cool. So this, these virtual machines might necessarily be uh, scoped to me or really be relevant. 
And so I can navigate into the different resource groups, and we'll go into my specific resource group. Should have done TE. There we go. And so what we do now is we scope all your commands to this resource group. And so if I do uh, git Azure RMVM, this is going to be automatically scoped to the resource group that I'm located in. And this applies to both uh, your virtual machines, your web apps, your storage accounts. And speaking of storage accounts, you, as you just mentioned, you're mounting your storage account. The reason we do that is because we have a cloud drive, and that's storage that's persisted across sessions. And so I can navigate over to my cloud drive, and you can see here that I have some docs folder and my profile. And th this storage inside the cloud drive is persistent between each container. So if I log out and log back in, these files are still there. So this is where you want to store your files, all your scripts, things like that. So just to demo this, I can, uh, we'll just do demo.txt and say, hello world. And so, so you know I'm not faking it, we can put the time in there. Help if I did it correctly. And so, and we have Nano, we have Vim, we have multiple different editor experiences within CloudShell. I personally prefer Nano. And so, we can do that here and we can see demo.txt is here. And we can cat demo. See, it's there. Perfect. And so if I exit out of the, uh, the session and I go to a different, uh, a different session, if I switch over to a bash container, and while, we're, while this is loading, I'll show you some other cool features that we got. We have uh, a pop-out, so if I click on this, this will launch me into a full shell view within the window. And so now I don't have the portal in the background. We also have uh, a restart the shell, or restart your cloud shell, and so this different, the, the, the differentiator between, oh, I forgot to push my button, so forgive me, we'll go a little bit longer. Uh, the differentiator between the, the, the restart is this disconnects your container and gives you a fresh experience. So this will do a full startup, opposed to just closing this or reopening your browser or your shell, that would just reconnect you to the existing container that you've already connected to. Yes, if you have questions, just raise your hand. Yeah. Did you guys do you support MFA? I do not know. Payment? Uh, when you say MFA, uh, in what context of MFA? So if, if, if you're uh, logging in with uh, an Azure account that you've enabled uh, multi Azure multi factor authentication, sure. um, is there any way to support that with this, or do you have to disable it right now? No, you don't have you don't yeah, you don't have to disable it. Um, any multiple, multiple uh, MFA will still get prompted when you log in. And so for example, I have MFA enabled on my mobile app. And so when I log into the Azure mobile app, I still get the prompt to do the MFA. But the, uh, does the, the prompt then launch in just your local uh, browser? Or is there something else that you're doing? Don't know for the browser experience. Because so, when, when you do it through regular PowerShell, you know, it'll, it'll use whatever your default browser is in the, in the frame window, the right. authentication prompt. So in, in this case, once you go to portal.azure.com, uh, the MFA is handled by the portal itself. Yeah. It does it at that level. Yes. Oh, Once you have yeah. you're, to the portal, then your contact just carries over. Yes, you, you're, you carry your auth. And so when you, we say you have a already authenticated shell, you're already, you, Azure's already done that authentication. So now we see we have our, our Bash shell open, and the great thing is we also have PowerShell Core within the Bash experience. And so the great, another good thing about uh, Cloud Shell is that we carry over and update the image. And so you can, you're guaranteed that you'll always have the latest and greatest. So here you can see that we have uh, PowerShell 6.1's preview, and even though this is only released. So we update the image uh, on a biweekly, weekly basis. And so you can see again that we've mounted the Azure Drive. So this is an experience that you get in just uh, your Bash experience. You have to be running PowerShell so you get ships and you can build that Azure Drive on top of that. And so we can navigate back to our home directory and in Cloud Drive and we can see oops, that we again have demo.txt and it's there again. So this is persisting across my PowerShell, my Bash sessions and across different containers. So I've shown you the experience for me, but what would it look for, look for most of you not using Cloud Shell before? So let me just do a hard reset and, oh, 
Oops, I. Equal sign does not mean dash. Wow. Yeah, it's going slow. There we go. Okay. So yes, I want to remove my storage, and we'll reconnect. And so this is what it looked like for you. You get prompted if you want to start a Bash environment in Linux or a PowerShell uh, session in Windows. So we're going to go with PowerShell. And assuming you don't have a storage account that you want to exist that existing that you want to mount, we can create one for you. You just select your subscription. I personally have one already configured. I'll just connect back to my old storage account that I was using. And so I just need to select on my right subscription, my the correct region, and we'll go back to my resource group and use my storage accounts. All right. And so this is probably something similar to what you were seeing a, a few minutes ago where it's building out your cloud drive again. So, so it looks like if I want to switch to Bash, it wants to restart and do some stuff. Yeah, so the, the reason is when you, you, we restart to Bash, we give you a new container. And so we close your existing container, and then we start you a new Bash environment. Since the, the same file? Uh, yeah, so they should all be mapped to that same geolocation, so you, uh, you still have that fast experience. The contain each time we restart the container, we're running a different OS. So for PowerShell, we're currently running uh, a Windows container, and for the Bash environment, we're running a Linux container. In the future, that will be moving. Or we have the idea that we'll move to a Linux container just so we have a more consistent experience with tooling, because currently our cooling our tooling is a little bit different from Windows, uh, a Windows experience versus a, a Linux experience. So is this PowerShell for them? So currently, what I have shown you, besides from the Bash experience, has all been Windows PowerShell. But we're with more module coverage, we're going to move to PowerShell Core in the future. And so I've shown you uh, two experiences so far, both the portal and shell.azure.com. With shell.azure.com, you can specify if you want to connect straight to a PowerShell or a Bash experience with just a slash PowerShell, slash Bash. And so if you have customers that you want to make sure they're going uh, directly to the correct experience so you can walk them through some steps, you can send them a link with that built in. We also have integration with Microsoft's Docs. And so if we go here, uh, this didn't pop up. Yes, off the network. So you see here, we're back into uh, Microsoft's Docs. And if I click on one of these tutorials, Cloud Shell is popping up side by side in your browser. And so if I log in, I will get a cloud, another uh, container in a session on the right hand side. And if I click through the tutorials, the same session stays open. And so you can follow along the tutorial uh, in your browser. Uh, we also have the Azure mobile app, which I talked about a little bit before. Uh, there's a little Cloud Shell icon on the bottom. And then we also have a more local experience with the Azure extension using VS Code. And so Heyman's going to talk about that a little bit. So the question is, are there any limitations about installing modules, copying them over? Um, so in this experience, you have your pack, uh, PowerShell get available. So you can use install module, install scripts. As long as um, you can download them, it gets saved to your cloud drive. It is available for the next one. So there's no. Nope. Now, the only thing that depends is, if you're running the PowerShell core version and the mod modules are not compatible, then obviously at runtime. The other aspect is since it's running in containers, if your module does a connection or login which pop up a browser, that won't show up here. Um, and that was a scenario with Azure RM module, but since it's already authenticated, you don't have to do it. Azure AD, we already take care of that, so you don't have to do those. But good question. <clears throat> so um, I will go and open the PowerPoint. That might be a good idea. Um, so Danny showed you how you can use it from the browser. One area that people said, oh, it's great, but you know there is this cross-plat thing called VS Code. What's the story with that? And I'll talk a little bit more about the VS Code extent, uh, experience and show you more demos. So this is the, I have two slides, one of them is this. Uh, so here, 
So here is the VS Code. How many you guys have tried using PowerShell from VS Code? How many of you still hate it and loves ISC more than it? Okay, so there are some people like, yeah, some things are good in ISC, something in good in VS Code. I was on the same uh, l lines that, oh, VS Code is new shiny thing, I don't know, uh, and it took me about Six months ago, I switched over and slowly, slowly, I'm like, oh, there's no reason for me to run ISE. But one thing people say a lot is, hey, if I open a file, let's see. It's a local file here. It doesn't look like ISE. It opens integrated console. I can kill it, remove it. Um, and it's running Windows PowerShell. It tells you, you can actually, once you install Um, you have your preference and you can change the color theme. And there is a PowerShell ISC color theme. So people who don't want to move from ISC because they're so familiar with it, you can tell them, hey, use this color theme, now it looks ISC all. So that's, that's the point of this. Um, and then in VS Code, there is an extension. So first let me show the extension before I go. It's called Azure Account. So there is this extension built with VS Code which lets you get your Cloud Shell in VS Code. And then there's another one called Azure Storage, which I'll talk about a little bit more. So those are the two ones. So you can say Control Shift P, type in Azure colon open. It'll give you option which one you want to open, the Bash Shell or the PowerShell Experience. And since we're in a PowerShell Summit, I'll talk about PowerShell. So you can click it and it's supposed to open your Cloud Shell terminal in VS Code. So same thing that is in your browser, if you really want to stay closer to your VS Code, you can come and get that. Um, and as one thing that Danny pointed out, if you have a session running, you disconnect from it and come back within a certain time period, uh, you get a faster connection because your containers is still there, even though you have disconnected, we uh, don't decommission it and then we connect back to it. But if that time uh, limit exceeds, then that container is taken away and when you connect, so sometimes you will see, oh, the connection is fast, sometimes it's slow. Yeah, there's some network piece of it, but most of them is if you're connecting to a new container versus an existing container. So here you have the same experience. You can do there. Again, it's connecting to your service the first time, finding all my subscription. Next time I do it, it's fast. Like, it's really fast. It did it. Uh, because we cache, so we go to the service once, get the information, build the navigation and uh, f thing here. And if you really want to say, hey, I created new resources, they are not showing up because it's a cache, you have an option of saying dash, dash, dash force, and it'll go and rebuild the entire cache. It'll go and check hey, if there's a thing any new and so on. So it's the same um, thing. Uh, let me show you, since we talk about Cloud Drive, there are two commands, dismount, Cloud Drive and get Cloud Drive. When you do get Cloud Drive, it tells you what is the file share name, what is the mount point, what's the name of the resource group, and all the information. So I have the default setting. I did not create the storage up front. In that case, your storage is created with some GUIDs and so on, and it's very difficult. So this kind of helps you to know which storage account you have, what is the file share name. And that brings to the point of, you go to Explorer in VS Code, since you have that Azure Storage, you can turn on and say Azure Storage. Now it will show you all your subscriptions and all your storage that is up in Azure. You can filter it down if you really want to not see all of them. I know here is my storage account name, CS some good. So I go, can go to my subscription. It is traversing and finding that information. Find my storage account, which has this funky name, uh, go to my file share. Here is the file share name, which is also pre automatically created for you if you don't select it. And I can go and see. And here are all my files. And essentially what it allows you is you can double click and it opens that file for you here. 
And this is the Okay, hopefully this time it will be better. Um, and this is what uh, Azure Storage Extension tells you. It's opening the file. You can go back to the terminal. Uh, it says, let's make a change. You can make a change to it. Say control save. It'll take that change, which is available locally, and upload it back to you. And in the same session, you can go to your home cloud drive and run cloudshell.ps1, and it, it writes. Future looking, we can do time travel, 2019. Uh, another thing that you can use with those two extensions is this is a local file. So let me just show you the files I have here. There's some five or six files. There's no file called localfile.ps1. You can right click and you can say upload. And it'll upload that file for you automatically to your cloud drive. And you do next time, and here you see that local file .ps1. So making things easier for you by um, integrating with VS Code, and now you do the cross-plat stuff, it's going to continue to work for you. The other thing is, um, how many of you know that you can run custom profile in the Cloud Shell? Okay, one. You guys don't count, you're in the team. <laughs> um, so I can go and see as there's a profile, I can go and double click my file, it opens up, and here I have a couple of things uh, commented out. Um, so let me just create my custom prompt, and there's a lot of Unicode stuff here. So I saved my custom prompt, make the changes to the file, saved, and now if I go and open a new shell, so remember the prompt used to be Azure, PS Azure, I'll go and say create a new one, and since I'm already connected to a container, this will be a pretty fast one. It authenticates. It tells a message saying loading your profile. And both kind of profiles are supported. You can just do a profile.ps1 or the full Microsoft dot blah, blah, blah one. And then you can do all Unicode or funky stuff that you want to do. Yeah. There are random stuff. It showed up automatically. I have no clue why. Uh, uh, other thing is um, tools. We talk about tools. Uh, right now, there is some difference of tools when you run on Bash side of the Cloud Shell or PowerShell side of the Cloud Shell, like Terraform is available only in the Bash shell. Ansible, which makes sense only on Linux side, is there. But one cool thing is Git. So you have Git already installed on both your environment. You can see what version you're running in. And just to show an example of how you can leverage these things is I have a website already running, running Azure Web App. Uh, it's essentially a Slack invite. Um, we played with Slack when we were doing the private preview of Cloud Shell. And anytime you want people to come and join in, you have to send them a URL. It might go to the wrong address. So this is a convenient way where you say, I have a Slack, uh, a website which does the Slack invitation. You can put it out there. People type in their email address, whatever they want, and it automatically joins a Slack group. So that's the same website I've set it up here, and you will notice um, that there's a lot of wrong in that highlighted sentence. I'm not going to go into the details of how it actually works. It's an open source project on GitHub. I can show you pointers if you guys are interested in that. Uh, but the cool thing is on my machine, I have the source code in my cloud drive. And that allows me, um, so here it is called Slack Invite Automation, and I can use Nano Slack Invite Automation, and I know where the setting is. So I can open that file in an editor called Nano, uh, and then I can go and say PowerShell and DevOps Global. And I am literally a bit challenged with VI, but I know enough to get by. Uh, escape, colon. Oh, this is nano, see? Uh, too many choices. Um, and since Git is there, let me make it up. You can see the status. Oh, wrong place. Go inside the directory. Um, you can see 
what files have changed or not. And ideally, you can even install posh git here. Uh, we do some custom uh, prompt in the Cloud Shell. So posh git doesn't work well. It doesn't show you the things, which is more of our issue. But we have to work with them and say, hey, can we get all the goodness of uh, posh git here? Um, and you can do regular commands, git add config, git commit. And the idea is once you make the change here, since your Azure web app is integrated with your local git, which is saved in your cloud drive, you can do git push Azure master. And it'll take these changes directly from here, go upload it to your website, refresh it, it's running node NPM stuff, everything just happens, and your website will get updated. So the value add there, and it got updated. So you can go and refresh it, and you will hopefully notice that things have been fixed. Uh, so the value add here is these tools allow you to manage your resources, your applications, on the fly if you really, really want to. And here, all those changes are there. OK. One other thing Danny showed you was PowerShell Core 6. So obviously, we are running Windows PowerShell here. Uh, you can do with PS version table. It shows 5.1. You can start PowerShell Core 6 here as well. So if you want to play with PowerShell Core 6, you get the latest version here. This is a very convenient place, a test bed you can play with, exp experiment with things, and just throw away. You don't even have to download. But since it's side by side, downloading in your local box doesn't impact anything that Windows PowerShell is doing, so that's also a safer environment. Um, and one question keeps coming all up across PowerShell Core 6 is like, oh, this is great, but uh, what can I do with PowerShell Core 6? It's so limited. So definitely that is true. That's the area we are working on. Um, if you look in your um, cloud drives today, you will see if you do get module, Azure RM, and this is PowerShell Core 6. These are four or five that we ship in box. But today morning they released the next version of Azure RM module on the gallery, which lets you download them, save them, and play. And since there are more of them, it's taking time. Uh, that number five goes from five to 55. So all of, or actually 58. Some of them are duplicate um, because they are already here. So I have, so essentially the point is that work of moving all the big uh, workloads to PowerShell Core has started. Azure RM is leading that front. A lot of that is coming because we want them, you guys to use Cloud Shell, um, and more things will happen in future as well. And obviously, uh, similar to that, if you do get command, dash module, Azure RM star major, you will get close to 1,800 commandlets there in PowerShell Core 6 experience. OK, two more things, and then I'm out of here. Or let you ask questions. Um, you can also play with Cloud Shell to have just fun. You don't have to do real hard work. I know everybody who's doing uh, system administration or DevOps kind of stuff. Life is hectic. You want some fun. So I have in my, OK, go to home Cloud Drive. So there's a demo that was written for Windows PowerShell, and I was trying to see how much of that can work here. So let's see. And you have Zen and Peace already for you here. You can do tab, and it changes stuff. So it's fun stuff, nothing fancy. But you can still do that, if nothing else. OK. So those were the things we had in the demo side of things. Any questions before we move on or talk about what's next? OK. Very engaging audience. No, that's fine. OK, so the demo part is done. Um, 
And here is a link, which I didn't get a chance to make it work and show you guys is mounting that your uh, Azure storage file. You can mount it locally on Windows as, an, as a drive. And you can use dash persist and save your credential. It will be there after reboot. So you can say, oh, my Z drive is always my cloud shell. So you can then use those files locally, make them changes, use any editor that you want, but still be attached to. And this is already documented. Uh, the biggest thing that I ran into, which I haven't solved yet, is opening the port 445 for outbound connection, which is the only thing that stopped me from getting it done in time. So just be aware of that, it's, it's there. Now the thing is future. So what is the future? Um, we know, and that is why there's first line which says, PowerShell startup can take up to a minute. That our startup is very slow. Um, it's not where we want it to be, but that's where we are at this point. So we are working there to make the startup faster. And it's not just faster, it's like somebody in my team says, you blink, 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 it's there. So if that is going to be that fast, I was, we were almost close to get a video of that to show you today, but we didn't reach there. It's, it's not available for everybody, even people in the team are waiting for it to be deployed and play with it. Um, we are moving, planning to move from Windows PowerShell to PowerShell Core 6 as the default experience here. That's the place all the investments are happening. We want more and more team to Core 6. Oh, I want Cloud Shell. Oh, it is PowerShell Core 6. So I should do PowerShell Core 6, as well as people to use it and tell us. Um, and the other piece that Danny already talked is, today the Cloud Shell experience is running on Windows container. Uh, the idea of a Cloud Shell is to manage Azure things or to go out of that container environment and manage something outside. A lot of people are trying to do and manage MSO online, Office 365 account, but every time you're going out of that environment to somewhere else, to a service or to another endpoint. So whether it's running Linux container or Windows container, it should have very little impact for the experience for, for going out. But it has a big impact in terms of tools, the cadence with which we can provide that tools and the startup. Startup of Linux is fast, we are going to make it even more faster, but it will be small delta. On Windows, it will be a big delta. So those, those were the thought process we had is like, where you want this investment to go six months, eight months, nine months down the line? Do we want to keep fighting? This tool works on Linux, it doesn't work on Windows, go talk to those teams, spend time, or says, make the tool work once and it work across. Uh, and definitely uh, integration with docs.microsoft.com, especially on the Azure side, has happened, but it hasn't reached the critical mask where you can go and say, oh, try it, try it for every document. So that's the area we are working on. So you can leverage and play and learn those things. And definitely doing the GA of the entire PowerShell side of the Cloud Shell. The Bash side is already ga last November. Uh, PowerShell was announced at Ignite. So we expect sometime this summer, late summer, we should be able to reach that point. And we did run a survey. Uh, I, there's a question coming, I know. Um, let me finish this one, um, which is essentially Cloud Shell Survey, ak.ms Cloud Shell Survey. And it talks about what is your pain points or um, your customers, the people you talk to when you move from Windows PowerShell to PowerShell Core 6, what things are missing or what will be a deal breaker. Uh, if you move from Windows container to Linux container. So those are the two aspects of the survey. We already tweeted about it, but it's good to get more people chiming. Question. Um, yeah, um, going back uh, when you were talking about like the, the modules and, and that, that pop-up, um, that might be what I was thinking of. Because um, I thought I tried the cloud shell and tried to do a connection to uh, Exchange Online. Okay. And with multi-factor enabled, you normally get the pop-up in your regular PowerShell. Right. There are plans for like some of those groups uh, that, that haven't really have a nice MFA integration. Right, so uh, the question is, uh, if you try to connect to uh, micro, uh, Exchange Online or Office 365 Online the, in the regular Windows PowerShell console, the multi-factor authenticate pops up, you can type things, what's the plan there? So um, that's something we are working in. Uh, essentially yesterday only we had a meeting with them, uh, a small meeting, and they're like, oh, we don't know whether MFA works. I'm like, no, it works. And actually, we were able to show that it's taken by Azure AD. So if you 
look at Azure AD when it moves to .NET Core, they will not have that pop up as easily. So we go, you can go to the device login approach, uh, which will work. So it was, oh, is that simple? I'm like, yeah, there's some work, but yeah, it's that simple. So that work is happening. The uh, Office 365 was very interested in saying, oh, all this PowerShell core stuff is good. What is this Cloud Shell thing? Can I use it in my admin center kind of experience? That's the other thing I was going to bring up is it's exposed now in Azure AD portal, but you know if you're doing a lot of Office 365 admin stuff, you usually have that portal. Exactly. To have a integration there. Yes. Um, so one thing I think Jeffrey has talked about in his session as well is we reaching out to Office people say, hey, do this. Like, oh, you are the PowerShell team, you are the Cloud Shell team. Obviously, you want everybody to use the technology. But if you go and say, hey, I've used it, I want this to happen, it carries one and a half to two times more weightage than us reaching out. So we are already working with them, but just hit the teams, whatever that team is, whether it's for Office, whether it's SharePoint or FUBAR, if you want something, not necessarily PowerShell, even if it's outside of PowerShell, something else, you reaching out, beating them up, makes more impact than we reaching out and asking them to work with us. So please continue doing that. Yes. What is the connectivity like from Cloud Shell to Azure resources? For instance, and I know I'm authenticated to my Azure subscription. If I have a virtual machine in my Azure subscription, it's not internet accessible. Or if I have Express Route configured from Azure to my on-prem infrastructure, is there any connectivity possible or is there any plan? Yes. So the question is, what is the connectivity from the Cloud Shell to Azure resources? For example, a VM, if it's not publicly accessible. So right now we have one experience which primarily relies on PowerShell remoting. There's a commandlet uh, in Cloud Shell. We don't talk about it uh, much because there are some, it's not as smooth as it should be, uh, which essentially uses PowerShell remoting and you have commands like uh, invoke Azure RM VM command and enter Azure RM VM. Those use primarily PowerShell remoting so the machine has to be uh, exposed to the internet, it should have a public IP address. Uh, that's an area we are looking at with the serial console work and run command that they have done. Uh, we are looking, we are planning to look into those and say how can we provide the same kind of experience like you get in Hyper-V through uh, VM bus connection, can we do that for Azure VMs from the cloud shell? So that's definitely something that's on our play, uh, uh, play to look at and also make the PowerShell remoting, whether it's over SSH or WinRM, make more easier because today run command is very one machine at a time kind of a thing. With PowerShell remoting, you can reach out to N machines, figure it out, and then do a specific SSH based session. So definitely that's something we're looking at. Yes? Is this all still happening over 443? And you don't have some weird port that's got to be open to make this work. When you say this, the so question is. Oh, I can get to Azure, yeah, and from like work I can get to Azure, but then I gotta go, because I go to my MSDN subscription, then I gotta go to the network guys and go, can you please open RDP to this? But, you know, I know 442 is open, so. Okay. Where it'd be nice if. <laughs> so, um, the question is, is it all, when, that's where I was kind of asking. When you say, is it all going to 443, are you talking about PowerShell remoting? No, or no, the no, connection no, to the portal? The, the, Yes, shall right. Well yes, it's, it's going over the standard net HTTP protocol, so HTTP, HTTPS, AT, and 443, yes. Uh, there are some issues with Firefox, I believe. So if you're behind a, like a load balancer, or if you're behind a proxy, proxy. Yeah, uh, the web sockets might not work. Right. So um, if you're behind a proxy or load balancer, the web socket, so the connection happens uh, through web socket between the actual container and the browser. So if you're behind those, then there are certain things you have to open up. I, I believe it's already documented in our docs because a lot of people ran into that. And especially if you are using Firefox, it shows up more often than if you are using Chrome or Edge. So that's documented, but if not, we, we can look at, but yes, there is that piece of proxies in Firefox. Any more questions? I don't think we have anything else on the slide. No. On, uh, I think maybe somebody mentioned this, but um, it, do you have any plans for like hybrid environments where you would 
you know, make it easier or, or use some type of proxy or like a hybrid one book worker um, to, to be able to manage on-prem environments via cloud shell easier without having to open up a bunch of ports for all the servers. So the question is, are there any plans to manage hybrid environment with Cloud Shell without opening too much ports and stuff? Um, we have not looked into that in detail, but we have talked with uh, Project Honolulu folks where uh, the discussion was, how can I get the PowerShell in that browser? Uh, and we talked about why, if you're trying, they were at that time looking only in a local scenario. So running a container or connecting didn't make sense. And what they actually needed was a front end like we are doing and the back end connection uh, t technology and they were able to achieve. As Honolulu moves more towards managing hybrid, we will definitely plug in into that scenario and make it happen. I don't have a specific timeline, but something has just started, that discussion just started around it. Using VS Code, uh, there was that, there's a drop down, I'm not sure you explicitly called it out, but you can switch back and forth. And so if you're using oh. VS Code, you can switch oh. back and forth from your Cloud Shell terminal and then switch to a local one as well. Oh, that, okay. So that's just built in. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I, I was taking the question more as can I yeah. use Cloud Shell? So I think as a, as a, you can keep, you can stay in the same experience and just change on a drop down. Right. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. So the, the, the comment Dan is saying is in VS Code, you have those terminals which can let you run Windows PowerShell, which is local, and the Cloud Shell. So you can use that for a kind of a workaround for the hybrid. Okay, last slide I believe is this, which is use it, tell people more about it, and let us know what kind of things that you find difficult to use. There is. Uh, user wise around Cloud Shell, which is all up Cloud Shell, when you submit an issue, you, it, you, you pick whether it's a general issue or it's a batch specific or partial specific. And then there's documentation around how do we, how do you learn more about it? We know there's room for improvement on the docs. So if you find open the issue, if you can contribute, that's even better, but telling us what's busted or, oh, I read this document, it doesn't make sense or it's too difficult, that's also a good idea for us to know. So those are the, Thanks and thank you for your time. Any more questions, I can take it.